welcome to today's webinar, which is all about life as an interim FD and CFO. My name is Phil Scott. I'm a director at FD Recruit, and I'm joined by expert panelists. Um, here today, we've got three expert panelists. The running order for today, just to cover it off, I'm going to do a, a panel introduction in a second. Um, then we've got a main set of questions that I'm, I'm going to put towards the panel, uh, which are pre-prepared questions, and then there will be time for questions from the audience, which I'll ask you to submit via the chat box at the bottom. Um, so we'll just uh, make the introductions there. First, we've got uh, Stuart Harris, who's um, over from Surrey. I'm going to ask Stuart to um, just tell us a little, a little bit about himself. How long have you been an interim FD? Um, what's life like for you at the minute? And has COVID-19 changed anything for you operationally? Do you want me to go? Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Stuart, Stuart Harris. Um, I've been an interim, I've been working as an interim pretty much um, 20, 25 years. Um, I qualified as a chartered accountant, uh, moved into tax for six years, uh, and then jumped into uh, Virgin, um, looking at their incubator businesses and, and putting just some basic financial disciplines into them. Uh, really enjoyed it, and I've stayed in the sort of the SME space. Uh, largely um, taking on sort of work that's run for uh, anything from sort of three to six months to, to three years, but short term. Um, how has COVID uh, impacted um, work for me? Well, it's made things very, very quiet in, in terms of um, um, earning fees, um, but it has opened up one or two opportunities with um, uh, carve outs and um, hive outs that are coming across the horizon in the next two to three months. Thanks, Stuart. And Sat Baines is uh, broadcasting from London. Um, how long have you been an interim? What's life like for you at the minute? And has COVID 19 changed anything for you as an interim? Hello, everyone. Uh, I've been an interim for five years now. Um, Prior to that, uh, I qualified with the Big Four and then joined Anderson Consulting, then moved primarily in the tech space. Um, I've done uh, co-founded a couple of software companies, been part of a management team and a couple of PE things, exited three of those quite well, and not so well in another two or three of those. Um, so I do a lot of, most of my work is really around helping SMEs and growth companies craft an exit strategy primarily and put things in place. So I can, that can be three months, raising money can be up to six months, some exits can be about a year. So I do that kind of work really, which is what I enjoy doing. Um, COVID's allowed me to refocus my efforts on what I want to do really. So I've enjoyed being with the kids, being at home. It's been quite refreshing to have some time off. Um, so my focus now really is to uh, just keep focus on the SME space and with founder CEOs, which is what I really enjoy doing. And in terms of work, there's sort of things popping up and sort of occurring, but, you know, I just spend my time looking to work with the right team, really. Thanks, Sat. Robin Paul, are you uh, broadcasting from your home in the Isle of Man at the minute? I am, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, how long have you been an interim FD? Uh, what's life like for you at the minute? And has COVID-19 changed anything operationally? Hmm. Well, I've been at this for 12 years now. Uh, again, a qualified CA, always been in manufacturing. Fell into interim work 12 years ago. Um, and I have operated in food and drink ever since. Um, been very fortunate. I've only had four clients in 12 years. But I've barely sat on the bench. Um, so I touch wood for that. Um, and I've operated very much as going into businesses as an interim finance director, hands-on in the business. Not, not so much advising from afar, but actually going into businesses, usually because there's been issues in the business or issues with the finance director, let's be honest. Um, I very much enjoy it. I enjoy the challenges that it brings. Um, I, I am very flexible when it comes to location, and that is a big part of being an interim, or has, has for me been a big part of being an interim, that I've been prepared to work wherever in the UK, because I'm not working in the Isle of Man. I'm going to commute every week regardless. COVID has meant I've had three months at home for the first time in 12 years. Um, it hasn't affected the contract I'm in. It's obviously impacted on the business I'm in, but it hasn't affected on the contract I'm in. Um, and it's really irrelevant that I'm an interim in, the, in these circumstances. Um, 
it's it is harder to manage a team of people from afar, but we're all in difficult situations at the moment. Thank you, Robin. So well, I'll start on the main set of questions. Uh, the first one uh, over to, to Stuart. Um, there's plenty of different definitions of what a, an interim balance director CFO uh, is and does. What's your what's your thoughts, Stuart, on what what an interim FD is? Well, I, I think it's the role that defines um, interim as opposed to uh, temporary or, or, or anything else. And, and um, I, I think there has to be uh, a defined outcome with the role, um, I, I, either a defined change in the way the business is, is operating or uh, an, an exit or, or, or some event. Um, and I think there's, there's also a finite period. Um, that, that those are the two things that define an interim role for me and, and, and obviously an interim CFO is, is somebody who, who jumps in and takes on that challenge. Thank you Stuart and Robin what's your thoughts uh, do you say similar on, on what a, an interim FD is? Yeah I haven't had so much pressure, I haven't had so much pressure on a final date. Um, my expression is you're a cowboy for hire, that you're just a sophisticated cowboy for hire um, and you've been brought in to do a specific task. Okay, and um, we, in the introduction, we sort of talked about um, you know backgrounds, uh, but um, Robin, what what was your background before becoming a, a, an interim, or you know, and, and more importantly, immediately before um, moving into, into interim? Just talk us through that. Well, I had I've been a manufacturing for manufacturing companies in Scotland and Isle of Man. Um, various things, but the company I was with in 2008 sadly didn't survive the credit crunch, and um, it wasn't it wasn't a plan to go into interim. It was a plan to get a job and get working again, and it just went from there. So you sort of fell into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and Sat, what about you? What how did you get into interim work? Uh, well, in 2015, I was the domestic and general. I was the group strategy director and I crafted the exit strategy. So once we exited, um, and I'd done my notice period thereafter, I walked away with the money. I really wanted to get back into the SME space uh, as opposed to being large corporate. Um, so DNG was a billion pounds of revenue, and I ran most of Europe as a CFO and COO. Uh, and then actually getting out of that and actually back into the SME space was quite important to me, really, because that's where I enjoyed working. So that's how I got into it. So I rang up a few friends, and. They got my first interim job, and for the first time in about 12 years, I actually prepared monthly accounts and set up accounting systems by myself and got my hands, actually worked with real people rather than sitting in meetings all day long. So um, very much like Stuart, I like outcomes to things, and I like interim work, which is basically a series of outcomes, do this, do that, do that, tick it off, success. If you don't tick it off, not success. So quite simple, straightforward work, really. I enjoy it. Uh, and that's exactly how it's moved. So it's most of mine's been through my network primarily, and a few through headhunters and um, people like yourselves, Bill. Okay, thanks, Sat. And, and Stuart, um, obviously you you sort of got into interim work, but why have you chosen to to remain doing interim work? Uh, I just I just enjoy the, the, the challenge. I enjoy the um, I actually enjoy the uncertainty and and, and the risk that goes with it and, and the exposure to, to, you know, all manner of, of different situations. You know, some of us will remember um, a, a series of programs by John Harvey Jones in, in, in the 90s called Troubleshoes, where John Harvey Jones went into various companies and sorted them out. And I thought, do you know what? I fancy doing a bit of that. That looks like fun. Um, and and, and um, I wouldn't sort of put myself anywhere near his, his level, but I, I just enjoy that, um, you know, the, the challenge of using your initiative and, and, and dealing with people, you know, you know, some really, I've had the pleasure of dealing with some really good people, really sharp people. Um, and, and I've also managed some um, ra ra rather difficult characters as well. Good. And what would you say, yeah, Stuart, the pros and cons are of being an interim? Well, I, I, I think it's that um, exposure to, to variety and, and I think it's, it's the challenge. I mean, you know, you are just constantly challenged. There's always something new, you know, uh, every, every assignment 
uh, will have a, a particular feature about it which differentiates it with all, all of the others. Um, and, and you've got to stay on your toes. Uh, you know, the one thing I learned very early on is that you cannot walk into an assignment and say, ah, oh, yes, when I was at ABC company, we did it like that. Um, because you know, it, it might mean something to you. It means absolutely nothing to the people that you're working with. They want to see you know, live solutions that are relevant to them. Um, and, and, and that's the challenge that I enjoy. Thanks, Stuart. Robin, what about you? What would you say the pros and cons are of, of being an interim? Yeah, all, all the things that they've got have mentioned. I mean, I, I think it keeps you young. You know, because you've you got to keep on your toes. You've got to keep looking. You've got constant challenges going on. So all the things the guys have said, the cons are the risk. Everybody's got to be, you know, you, you, don't, have a, you don't have a salary. You don't have a pension contribution um, and all those sort of things. But for me now, after 12 years, um, it's, the, it's the independence that you have as an interim as well. You, you, have to be, you have to behave internally as a director and behave as, you like, as if you were a proper director, but in, in the back of your mind, you still have a degree of independence that you, don't, you wouldn't have if you'd been in the same corporate company for 10, 12 years. Thanks, Robin. And, and Sat, what services do you uh, provide for companies then? What, what, what typical services, Sat, do you provide? Well, then everything from um, typical um, interim, sorry, FD type roles, but normally it's about project based stuff usually for me. So there's um, issues around exits usually, or there's a, as Stuart said earlier on, there's a problem. And as Robin mentioned, there's a problem with the existing FD and they need some support or they need that person individually replaced. And there's normally a specific set of issues that need to be, need to be fixed around that. So I offer all the services around it really. So I do everything from um, sorting out accounting systems, project managing, issues, challenges, sorting out debt financing, also sorting out actually cash flow, all the basic kind of stuff that you'd expect, but at a, at a more of a critical level than you'd normally expect on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I avoid sort of complicated tax issues purely because um, it's been a long time since I did anything tax-wise. I think there are a bunch of better people around it, really. But I normally do the change agent stuff. That's what I really focus my energies on. Um, I don't spend an awful lot of energy working outside that because I just don't need to, really. Okay, and Stuart, what, what sort of services do you provide? Is it similar or anything different? It, it is. I mean, the opening brief is is, is very often um, we've got a problem with finance. You know, uh, just go in and sort it out, and, and and that's the sort of the length and the breadth of of, of the brief, um, and and um, you know often it, you start dealing with the effect. So the effect is you've either got a displaced finance director or you've got a displaced finance function um, and, and you've got to move sort of fairly quickly to pull that together. Um, but you know, that, that's not the end of it. You, you've actually got to make that finance function integrate and, and work with the business. And actually what I found, you know, doing a series of interim uh, assignments is that, you know, the brief is, is, is very often around the effect um, and you can address the effect, but if you're going to make a lasting difference to the business, you've actually got to nail the cause. Um, and, and the cause is, is often um, uh, right at the top of the company. Uh, and and, and um, uh, managing that is, is, is probably the greatest part of the challenge. Thanks, Stuart. And is, is there a, a typical type of client profile uh, for you, Stuart? Uh, <laughs> can I say there's a dysfunctional stakeholder usually somewhere in the mix <laughs> and leave it at that <laughs> right. which, which well, comes back to what I was saying earlier you know you, you, you're often, very often dealing with the you're, you're asked to deal with the effect um, uh, and, and not the cause Okay, thanks, Stuart. And, and Robin, I think you mentioned... Uh, Would you like me to leave now, Phil? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. Pl plenty more questions. <laughs> uh, Robin, you mentioned, did you say food, particularly food, beverage, FMCG? What, what's your typical client profile? Yeah, it's become that. I don't know, I don't know how many people on the call are, are in food and drink at all, but it's an incredibly incestuous industry. And almost once you're in it, and it's a great industry to be in, 
particularly as a manufacturing industry, because it's still in the UK. I'm still old. I've worked in industries that don't exist in the UK any longer. Um, so I've, I've got myself into food. I've become a foodist, and I'll probably I'll probably end up remaining a foodist whether I wish to or not. Um, so it's it's a food business. And Stuart sums it up perfectly there. Normally, there is no actual brief. There's just a board or an owner or a PE house know they've got a problem with finance or the finance director and they want someone with the experience to go and sort it out. I mean, I've never had a black and white brief at all. It's almost like we know we've got a problem. You seem to know what you're talking about. You go and sort it. Okay, and um, I think people on the uh, on the call sort of listening in or very keen to see how people get the assignments. Obviously, Robin, you, you know, you're you're carving a bit of a niche there. So how, how do you get your assignments? I know you mentioned it earlier, but just to um, reiterate. Well, I've only had four. The first was via recruitment. The second was a contact that I bumped into on a train. Um, the third was a recruitment agency, as was the fourth in the current contract I'm in. Um, but it, it, in my industry, if they see food and drink on your CV, you're put to the front of the queue. Yeah, fair enough. But, um, and Sat, how, how do you normally get your assignments? Very much like um, Robin's. My first one was a um, contact, um, and that was supposed to be for one day a week for a couple of weeks. Ended up being for six months, six days a week. I mean seven days a week and 24 hours, etc. Um, second one was also through a contact, a contract, started off being quite small, but ended up being big and lasted about 18 months. Um, and the third and the fourth one were through contacts and the last one was through an agency, uh, something like yourself. Um, and they've all, but they've all had the same, very much like Stuart has indicated and Robert's indicated, there's always a problem. And the issue is the fact that can you articulate an answer to a problem you don't really know before you get in there? And that's sort of what they really want to get out of, out of you, really. And most of it's really based upon, have you done something like it before? So when you even have a conversation with friends, et cetera, it's all about what can you do for me? And I'm very much like Stuart's bit. They have real sort of objectives they want you to tick off. And the cause is always usually, you know, somebody dysfunctional at the CEO, chairman kind of level, which is quite complicated when you're interim. And, and so how, how long is the typical assignment for you? I mean, you said you've been, been doing this for you know, the five shortest years. Has been, yeah, the shortest has been six months and the longest has been 18 months. And I, and I had to end the longest one because it, it was just getting silly when I was running everything. It was just, you know, and they, and the, you know, it was, you get, you, you, I'm, I'm like Stuart, I think interim should be interim. You know, they need to move to a permanent solution and, the difficulty was the fact that he was a very difficult person to work with. <laughs> I found him fine, but I could see how other people found him to be quite complicated. So I quite liked interim to be interim, but I was enjoying myself, so it just carried on a bit longer, really. Great. And Stuart, what about yourself? How, how, what's the typical length of assignment been for you? Well, it's, it's you know, generally it's six to, to 18 months. I mean, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, similar to Sat and, and, and Robin. Um, um, you know, sometimes it's the shortest three. It's, it's, it's very rarely, you know, sort of less than three to four months. Um, uh, but, I mean, I, I, I would add, um, you know, I, I, I kind of find that finance, my, finance probably accounts for, a, well, it probably accounts for about 30, 40% of, of, of what I do. The rest of it is just applied psychology uh, and you get some assignments, you know, just, just sort of um, tapping into what Sat was saying a few moments ago. You get some assignments where it's actually 90% applied psychology and 10% finance. Um, and and those, those tend to be the um, uh, assignments that run at the shorter end. But just, just picking up, just going back to the, the question earlier about how we pick up assignments, it's interesting to hear um, uh, Robin and Sat's point of view. I'm, I'm very much more a generalist. Um, so, so in the past couple of years, I've, you know, I've, I've done a jewelry, I've done petrochemical, I've done builders merchants, I've done recruitment and, 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 and a number of things. And, and 
picking up assignments is, is, is one of the greatest challenges. You know, you need to get a, 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 a sort of a, an A-list contact network, which is, is sort of fairly tight, that you know, can either um, give you work directly or feed you into um, people who, who are looking. Uh, and that, that's how I pick up most of my work. Thanks, Stuart. And um, how are interims expected to add value and how do you define success? You asked me. Yeah. Um, how do we add value? Um, well, I think we add value if everybody's feeling pretty happy at the end of the assignment. Um, and, and sometimes that's a consequence of doing um, an enormous amount of work in a, in a very short space of time. Um, and, and sometimes it's actually not, not doing very much at all. Um, it, it, it's actually, um, it, it's actually redistributing responsibilities, you know, properly around the business and, and, and giving people confidence to take, to, to, you know, sort of take on more work. I think the, Thing that I try to do is, is, is try to knit finance into the business and get people involved with um, with the planning side of it and, and understanding you know the budgets that they hold and if I leave a business and, and I've achieved that then I think I really have added value to the business and, and that's a success for me always. Thanks Stuart and, and Robin say, same to you you know would, any thoughts on how interims are expected to add value and, and how you define success your your board or your owner i've got to have confidence in your board as a as an accountant first as a finance director they have to have confidence in the numbers and the presentations you're making and they have to have confidence that you know what you're talking about you know the business you know what's going on in the business every day so the first thing is to to prove to the people that, that put you in there that you can give them the confidence they're looking for in the in the to use an awful expression the corporate governance of the company and the second thing to me that's, that's the next most difficult thing is you are going into a company as a very senior person but an, as an interim and you're normally the number two in the business to the ceo and i found in, in my major contracts it is the relationship with the ceo who's looking for a strong number two business partner at his side that makes the difference. If that works and you gel with that person, it doesn't matter if you're an interim or not an interim. You're giving that CEO the support that he or she wants. That's how I judge you. Thanks, Robin. And um, moving on to um, sort of how you charge out. How do you charge out, Robin? For, you know, for your services. What's uh, what mechanism? Just a limit. Just a limited. Just a limited company on a daily rate. I, I, but I do always, I do actually try to take the expenses out of it where possible, include that in the daily rate, so you don't get into an, arg an argument every month on expenses. That's one tip I'd give people. Okay, thanks, Robin. And Sats, what about you? How do you charge? Yeah, no, like Robin, I do uh, limited company daily rate. Um, in in all my assignments, the daily rate has gone up. Uh, primarily because the clients wanted me to do more and more things and sort of like we ended up ended up charging more and more. I try and include expenses in the daily rate. The one time I didn't, it did cause, <laughs> it just got, you know, it was silly really. We're senior people and you should be involved in that. Kind of, it's just, it's hassle. So I'm with Robin, get it out. The other thing I do is the fact that with a specific set of outcomes, like on raising money or we're doing an exit, there's normally bonus around that on top of that. Um, so it just depends. It depends on where you start off and exactly how you get involved. Really. But I'm pretty flexible. And the key thing is, you know, Stuart and Robin have said, you've got to have a good relationship with the people around you. Once you start building value and credibility, the rate does go up. I mean, I find the rate always goes up because it gives you more and more things to do. And as Stuart says, the more you integrate finance back into that into the business, the greater capacity you allow for that business to grow, suddenly more work arrives out of it. I mean, just, uh, you know, it just sort of, links through. I've done a couple of um, M&A projects as well with some of the clients I'm in, which came out as I was there. And that resulted in both increased rate because obviously there's a lot more work required. And also you have to bring in other people. So how you manage that is quite interesting. Thanks, Sam. And Stuart, what about you? How do you, do you charge out? 
same. It's limited company, daily rate. And um, as the site says, if, if there's a defined outcome, um, then um, th there's often negotiation around um, you know, completion, um, successful completion. Okay. And um, one of the things that I fully expected to be in the chat box and is, uh, but what we've also got as a pre prepared question is the IR35. So, St Stuart. Obviously, charging through a limited company, do you, do you feel the changes that are coming up to IR35 will affect anything? You, what's your stance on, on things? Well, I, I think the, the, the threat is always there. Um, but, um, you know, I, I actually employ somebody to look after my, my tax um, because I don't trust myself to, you know, sort of keep up to date with, um, you know, some of the finer points. And, and, and having somebody who's in practice in this sort of thing um, you know, every day, who, who knows, um, you know, where HMRC in, in their thinking is incredibly useful. So um, I'm, I'm sort of tracking it through my advisor. Um, and and um, you know, if, if I feel there's a change that, that, that then we talk. Um, and and um, yeah, I mean, our, our view is it's always there. It hasn't impacted me yet. And, and, and I'm not expecting it to impact me in the next few months but who knows okay robin what's your thoughts on uh, the ir35 changes is any any of that got a bearing for you yeah certainly delighted it was well. there's no doubt about that um and my position is further complicated by my offshore status um so yeah i was you know more than delighted that that was deferred um, and we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But let's be honest, none of us are in the poor house, so we'll just maybe have to take a little bit of a bite. Okay. And, and Sat, what about you? What's uh, your opinion on the IR35? Because in, in April it was supposed to go through, and I think a lot of people had started to change their stance on, on anything. Did you, were you changing anything, or were you carrying on as normal? Uh, I'm with the other guys. It didn't impact me at all, but I did notice that some of the larger corporates, I, mean, I, and I don't do that kind of work anymore, but they were they were actively um, challenging your status. Not me, but some of my people I know. Um, and some of the guys in technology and the software developer types. You know, it's always been a bit more vague to me in terms of exactly how... Vague's the wrong word. It's a bit more interesting in terms of how they position themselves in IR35. Um, they've had this situation challenged quite aggressively, both by HMRC and their clients. So I think you are seeing the clients taking a bit more of an interest on it, roles at the larger end. But in the kind of work that Stuart, Robin and I do, which is the fact that we do proper interim work, we're not there long term, but we move on. I think we're much, I think we're going to be okay, but who knows, right? You know, it's um, lots of things are okay with HMRC one day and then 10 years later they're not and you get a tax bill. So it is what it is. Mm. I mean, I suppose it comes down to the IR35 test on the government website and how much you think you're, you're one side or the other. But my experience is um, if you sat at the top, then you're not being delegated to micromanaged. Uh, you're not, you're not timesheeting every minute that you do, clocking in, clocking out. So you are um, in a stronger position. I'm not going to uh, go out there and say... Uh, anything that people appoint to me and said Phil said but um, I do think uh, the contracts can be set up and the projects and the wording can be set up um, for your level of work um, you know more appropriately than uh, someone who may be further down the food chain so uh, watch the space and get get advice I think is the the key thing there so uh, just moving it on uh, Robin um, question for you then so what has been your best assignment thus far and why? Uh, four years, um, private equity owned heartbeat business in Manchester, 150 million pounds turnover. Never, never had a been. Never had a been at the close of any day. And um, weekly payroll, you had a wee drink on a Thursday night if you met it. And although it was, it was blooming hard work, but I had a wonderful team around me. Um, very hard business, but keeping that alive, keeping that afloat, earning the respect of the PE house, probably the most satisfying contract I've done. But hence, some of the grey hair. Yeah, I think that 
going from memory, that was a while ago. I think we met uh, at the uh, Village Hotel uh, just around the corner while you was on that assignment. Uh, that must have been a, a while back. So um, over to, uh, to 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 you, Sat. What's what's been your um, best assignment so far, and, and why? Yeah, it was a it was a software company I tried to buy back in in 2000, and he wouldn't sell it to me. And um, literally, uh, 16 years later, I'm in a pub and he walks in. Bizarrest thing. And uh, he says to me, oh, you know, I've been thinking about you. You know, that's very odd. I've not been thinking about you. but you know. And he said, um, but I've got a bit of a problem. Anyway, he articulated the problem. And I said, oh, yeah, I can come and help. Um, and he turned out to be fundamentally a lot more than that. And at the same time, he became very ill. So... You know, I went from being the number two guy in to actually sort of taking over the whole thing until he got back on his feet again. But he was actually turning a company around again into the sort of thing that was a very fast-growing company back in the day. It sort of lost its way, really. Very satisfying, very enjoyable, very lucrative. Uh, so all the things hit it, really. And the investors were happy, I was happy, you know, etc. So it all worked out in the end really well. Uh, and changing culture and, as Robin said, having the satisfaction of the fact that, you know, you're giving people security of employment going forward because it was in a bit of a precarious situation when we met thanks yeah and then um, uh, question for you sat then might be the same thing but what what's been your most challenging assignment and why the same one um and the challenge bit you know coming back to what Stuart said uh, earlier on and, and robin alluded to is the fact you've got to have a very good very good relationship with the guy at the top you know the guy who runs it and normally the people at the top are the ones who are causing the problems. You know, finance directors don't get fired usually because they're incompetent. They get fired because they have an issue with what's going on around them that over a period of time, they look as if they're incompetent. And that's what happens, right? So, uh, and so dealing with the, with, he's a very, very clever bloke, but he's emotionally intelligent. And I wouldn't say that I'm exactly, I'm, I'm an accountant, you know, emotional intelligence isn't my number one thing. You know, it's, it's in my bag of toolkits, but it's not my number one thing. But as an interim, your emotional intelligence has to really ramp up. And helping him understand the fact that he was actually the problem that was causing some of the issues, that was a very delicate task because I liked him personally and he's a very good friend. And we are still very good friends. Uh, but managing that process was actually incredibly challenging because it was his baby. And he'd grown to 250 people, 20 odd million pounds of turnover. But he got to a point where he actually didn't know what to do with it. I mean, he, he lost himself. Um, him taking a year out helped because he was ill. And that helped him come back in a lot more focused and a gentler manner in terms of running his business, which helped. Thanks. And uh, Stuart, what, what, what's your, been your most challenging assignment and why? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I'd say well said, Sat. Uh, I, I think you've hit the... the the nail on the head as far as challenging assignments go. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I think any assignment where you have a stakeholder who tries to control what you do rather than giving you the sort of headroom to, to, to operate in, in a sort of um, uh, direct capacity is, is going to make the, the, the assignment very, very challenging in, in, in indeed. Um, and as an interim, you, you'll inev inevitably get um, some of those. So. Um, I wouldn't want to single um, any one particular one out for, for, for obvious reasons, but um, you know, it, it, it is having that person at the top who, who is just on a very different agenda to uh, the agenda that the company ought to be on. Thank you. And um, my mind's gone blank there. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart, just staying with you, um, and, and, and shortly we will go to the uh, audience questions. So um, the, uh, if anyone does have any questions, if you start putting them in the chat box, we'll start to, um, to run through those shortly. But um, yeah, Stuart, staying with you, um, what advice would you give to a interim or someone who's thinking about becoming a professional interim? What advice would you um, give someone? I would say, um, obviously, make sure your core skills, the core finance skills, are, are up to scratch. Um, as, as Sat said, you need very, very good people skills, people management skills. Uh, I think you need to have a very open mind, um, and I think you need to have broad shoulders. 
And, and finally, I, I would say, I think you need to be quite rigorous about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Um, and, and what you're not going to do is do other people's jobs for them. Uh, I, I think that's critical. Uh, it's a critical part of the management piece um, and, and something that I think, you know, interim should be very mindful of. Thanks, Stuart. And Robin, same question to you, really. What advice would you have uh, for anyone who's um, thinking of becoming a professional interim? From a personal standpoint, um, have, have some money in the bank first and understand you're losing your security. And I'll go back to my, my cowboy for hire comment. That's, that's what you're becoming. Um, but the other big thing, and I agree with everything that the chaps are saying, but the other big thing is you have to spend that time at the start of an assignment to fully understand in detail your actual P&L and your actual balance sheet and how everything works. You know, you know you, you, you've got to, you've got to know it in the, they, you're expected to know it in great detail and it's very soon forgotten how quickly, how, how short a time you may have been in that business and a board and your boss, your CEO will expect you to know the detail and you've got to find a way at the start of every assignment to spend significant time understanding exactly how your P&L, your balance sheet and therefore your cash flow works in detail. If you don't do that at the start, you, you're not going to, you're not going to, do the assignment as well as you should do. If it is an assignment like my mine is, which is acting as the finance director, I'm not going in and giving advice, I'm acting as the finance director. Thanks Robin, and um, another question to you Robin. Um, what advice would you um, give to a business who's thinking of hiring an interim finance director? Um, I was hoping you wouldn't start. I don't, I don't, I've never been able to really put myself on our side. It's a difficult question to answer, to be honest. Um, I suppose, you know, maybe, maybe make the brief clearer, um, if possible. Um, accept what you're getting, accept what you're paying for. Um, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not really qualified to, to give much advice on that side of it because I've never been on that side of the table. Never. And really, to me, whether you're recruiting an FD or an interim FD, it always boils down to getting the people and the dynamics to work. You've got to choose the right person, whether they're in the interim or not. Thanks. And uh, Stuart, what, what, what advice would you give to a business looking to hire an interim? Well, I, I'd pick up um, on, on Robin's point about the brief, you know, and, and um, just be very clear in, in, in what you think the brief is and have that discussion with the interim um, you know, immediately you know, as part of the interview and, and set your own expectations. I think the other thing um, that, that, that I would throw in is um, the need to work with the interim um, you know, through, through the assignment. You know, don't, don't just sort of throw the work at the interim and you know, expect them to work in a locked room then come out at the end of it with all the results um, it actually does pay to to you know keep good communication um, going with, with, with the interim um, and, and, and I say particularly work with him I think one of the most in one of the one of the areas where I bring the biggest value to, to, to businesses is, is is in the planning um, and, and, and putting some fresh thinking into the planning and getting people involved and, and that's that's how I you know, sort of get to understand, um, you know, the, 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 the mechanics and, and, and the levers, really get to understand the mechanics and the levers of a, of a business. But you need to work with people in the business who, who have that historic understanding to, to, to really get underneath that. So that my advice would be work with the interim. Thank you. Uh, seem to have lost Sats from the call temporarily. So uh, it's going to put we're going to move to the audience questions. So Stuart, Robin, you may have to uh, bear the brunt of the, the questions. Um, so really, I'll just uh, allow either of you to sort of jump in on them and I'll read them out. So one of the first questions uh, from Niall, who's uh, tuned in, he says the biggest obstacle seems to get in, into positions that look for someone with transactional or exit or PE experience. And if you don't have that experience, um, how do you sort of circumvent this? So I suppose we just talk about if there's if there's particular experience that you don't have. So Stuart, 
Any thoughts on that one? Well, yes, a, a lot of these sorts of positions are driven by the PE House, who, who, who um, uh, are instrumental in, in making these appointments. Um, so you need to have a very, very good network in, uh, within the PE Houses, and, and, and that, that, that is difficult to maintain at, at, at the best of times, um, uh, unless you have you know, sort of very strong established relationships, you know, you know that, that they tend to go back to people who've you know worked with them on past transactions and, and, and pulled them back in. So going into it fresh is is, is quite challenging. You just got to um, you know sort of brush up on your networking skills. You know, be prepared to go out and drink them under the table a few times. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, um, I'll move on to the next question. So we're just on the audience questions now. So. Uh, I'll allow anyone to sort of jump in uh, on, on the questions. So um, what are the key skills and behaviours that you that make a good interim FD? Who wants to uh, answer that one? That's I think that the... I, 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 oh, go on. Sorry, you go, Robin. I think some of the things we've touched on, I mean, you have to have the experience to do it. And I, I can't actually remember who said it first, but every client is different. You can never take the same thing from one client to the next client. Um, you've you've got to be flexible. You've got to understand what works for that business, not what works for you. If that makes sense. Thank you, and Stuart. Yeah, it's 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 you know it, it's never letting go of those core skills, those core you know sort of finance skills that you have. Um, good communication skills, good people skills, you know, um, and, and just that sort of awareness. Um, you know, and, and, and I think, I think if you go in with a positive attitude in, in, into a business, particularly if the business is 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 struggling, you're there because you know they're facing a crisis. I, you know, I, I think you know, just having a positive um, attitude and energy, uh, and, and I, <laughs> energy is critical. Uh, really, you know, particularly in, in those early days. If you walk in looking grey and, 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 you know, knackered, um, forget it. <laughs> you, you're never going to get the, you're never going to get things off the ground. You've got, you've got to go in with your shoulders back, chest out, smile on your face, you know, uh, and, and, and lots of energy. Come on, guys, you know. There's nothing wrong with grey, is there, Robin? I didn't. I was, I was going to let him off with that one. <laughs> 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 so uh, another question says do you agree with the LinkedIn ethos of it, um, it's who you know and not just what you know um, any thoughts on that one well, I think it's a mixture I think it's a mixture of what you know and of course you have to know you have to know someone to actually apply what you know um, so I think, coming back to what everybody said, I think the key is to work out what your strengths are in an interim. That's pretty critical. And what things you like doing and be very clear about what you don't like doing. And then telegraph that very clearly to everybody you meet. So they think about you and something's actually going to be happening. Um, but whatever situation turn up, that will only be, to be, to be the beginning. Because interims are, much, um, are, are a very complicated set of things that occur after, after you walk through the door. So you may have thought you were going in for you know, item A, B, C, D. You suddenly turn up, you have to rip that up after day three and work out to do something else. But you've got to have the energy, the clarity of a plan. And that's what most of these businesses are looking for, is someone's actually got a plan. Okay, thanks, Sat. And uh, I'm going to throw this at, at Robin, actually. Uh, uh, one of the questions, do you see your role as fixing the effect or do you have to fix the cause? Going back to what we were talking about earlier. It, it's a bit of both, but you know, you, 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 I've ended up being in businesses for so long that there's always so much change going on in terms of the, the inside of the business and the, and the market it's in. I don't see it like that, to be perfectly honest. There's always, there's always something has happened and in my circumstances, something has happened before I've gone in. Hmm. That's why I've gone in in the first place. So I suppose I'm fixing that, but be 
beyond that. No, that's 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 too cute English for me. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, the, the next question is for me. Do do interim roles usually get uh, advertised? The the main thing for me is finding the contract itself. Um, I think it depends on certain agencies that are pure interim. Um, if they feel they've got a, a quite a full um, roster of, of interims, may cease to advertise. Um, they probably start advertising to get to a full roster. Um, for us, it depends on the turnaround um, and if we need to go outside. So we do advertise quite a lot um, more just to have this sort of uh, the, the, the shop is open sign uh, flashing. But um, occasionally, if we think we're going to, if we th if we think we've got a ready to run shortlist and there's a quick turnaround, we wouldn't advertise it because what we've also got to do is be around to field um, any inquiries. You know, a lot of people will contact the recruiter and should contact the recruiters through LinkedIn um, only if they feel they're you know, pretty appropriate for it. So there's times where we won't advertise it if we just think we don't have time. You know, if, if we're back to back and we don't have time to. Um, field any inquiries so um, yeah case by case for that one so then just coming on to you Stuart there's a question in the chat box for you um, how do you define an A-list network um, who are the best contacts to have um, and it's sort of uh, prompting professional advisors are they, uh, are they the, the contacts so over to you Stuart yes I mean it's, it's it's really people who, who are going to be exposed to clients coming forward with um, potential assignments. So um, uh, I have my, my, my best contacts are, are probably in the um, advisory space um, dealing with uh, SMEs. So uh, corporate finance houses uh, are, are a very good source. Um, uh, the accounting firms, pe people within the accounting firms, um, rather than the accounting, you know, sort of dealing with the accounting firms themselves, I, I, you know, in, in the BDOs and um, um, RSMs of, of the world, you know, I, I've probably got sort of five, six really good contacts in each, um, you know, who, who will give me a heads up on something coming through very, very early doors and, and, and other firms. Um, and then just maintaining, um, you know, contacts with you know, people in and around the PE space and, and networking. As I said, you know, there are one or two networking groups that are well worth going to. Um, you just pick them out and, and make sure you're there on a regular basis. Thanks, Stuart. One of the other questions that's come through, um, I'll probably put more to Stuart and to Sat, uh, is about how, how many months on average do you work uh, per annum? Uh, is this your choice or not? So I know Robin's uh, assignments have all been the four in 12 years. So I'm guessing uh, you're planning breaks within those assignments uh, like you would if you were a permanent employee. But um, I think um, Sat and uh, Stuart, um, I'll start with Sat. Do, do, you have, do you just take breaks as and when the contract finishes? How does it work for you? How do you get in holidays and things? Well, I have uh, uh, two young children, so I take all the summer off and um, and all the uh, holidays that kids have at school. So I take all those off, um, and then I work around that mostly. So I think the longest break, um, I forced break I've had has been a couple of months, um, but breaks of choice are usually longer. So it depends. Usually, at the end of an assignment, I'm usually quite exhausted because <laughs> it's just by the very nature of the things. Um, and if, especially if it's a long one, like it's been six months and six, seven days a week, and long hours, at the end of it, I want a good two or three months off anyway. Um, and I'll recharge my battery. So I would say that, you know, in the last five years, I've done about average nine months on, three months off, I would say. Okay, thank you. And Stuart? There's no hard and fast rule, really. I mean, I, I had uh, four and a half years flat out, um, you know, sort of multiple assignments, um, you know, no, no breaks apart from a couple of, you know, a, a few short holidays. Um, you know, more recently, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's been very quiet. That's, that's partly been through choice and, and partly been, you know, because there's a sort of a lack of work going around. Um, 
you know, and I suppose because of that, I, I've just decided to, um, you know, take time out and, and do other things. Thanks, Stuart. So I'm going to put this one to you. Um, uh, this is from Lee. I start my first interim role on Monday after 20 years of being a permanent employee. Any tips on my first two weeks? How should I approach those first two weeks differently? Uh, I think approach like you would a new job, except that the accelerator is on. So you may have normally, you know, lovely new job. You get three months to sort of bed in and get to know everybody. It's all quite, you know, gentle and sort of easily in. Is an interim. You have to acclimatize very, very quickly. Make sure the fact that the number of issues you actually understand are the number of the issues that the CEO and the colleagues you're working with actually want you to focus on. Then come back with a plan pretty quickly. Say you're going to resolve them. And then learn to communicate a lot more effectively than, you, than you've ever done before. As an interim, the CEO knowing what you're up to is absolutely mission critical. And get their guidance about they're actually happy with what you're actually doing because you've got to make an impact quite quickly as an interim. So I would say that, you know, enjoy it. It's going to be fabulous because it is a great thing to do. But focus on what you think your plan is going to be and make sure you check the plan out on a regular basis. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sat. So the next one uh, from Tony, I'm going to put uh, to Robin, uh, and it's about um, whether you're prepared to turn assignments down or does anything go. Uh, what level of due diligence do you undertake um, before taking an assignment, Robin? Um, well, I'll check out the company as much as I possibly can, the people involved, the accounts, etc., etc. But I. Again, I've, I don't sort of turn assignments down, but there's certain things I wouldn't look at. I would not now look at a divisional FD who didn't have full business responsibility. He didn't have full balance sheet cash flow. I've done one short assignment, which didn't work out. And it was basically just a glorified, it turned out to be a glorified factory accountant as part of a huge group. That doesn't work for me. I need to have P&L balance sheet cash flow. I need to have the whole thing. Um, so I, 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 you know, sometimes you need work, but there's no point in taking work that you know is not going to work for you. And I know that doesn't work for me. I've got to have the whole picture or nothing. Thank you, Robin. I'll put this one to Stuart, this next question. Um, when you're expected to manage a reasonably sized team, how does the team react to you being an interim, uh, particularly when they don't, um, see you there as a long term uh, I think you always get a, a sort of a honeymoon period of um, a couple of weeks and and um, I, I think you've, you've got to make the most of that honeymoon period and I think you've got to work out very quickly who your enablers are and who your blockers are going to be and you want to reach into your enablers um, who, who are going to support what you do. Um, and if you bring them on board, then they'll do the work for you in terms of carrying the team. And, and, and again, uh, as I said, this is where the sort of the you know, bright, happy face and, and, and energy, um, you can sweep people along very quickly. You know, if, 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 if you know the, 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 they, they see that you've got the energy to carry out the task, and I think also I, I think you, you've got to be prepared to you know use all sorts of you know tools and tactics, you know, and, and you've got to be very careful in, in, in how you manage them. You know, so you know on the surface, you know you, you, you're you're sort of bright, you know, positive and everything else, but I think you've also got to be prepared to you know take people you know to one side and, and say you know. <laughs> If you want to mess with me, sunshine, you know, I've got some clout and I'm going to use it. And there are occasions when you do need to, 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 to do that. It's rare, but when you do need to do it, you need to do it very, very quickly. Just to let people know that, you know, you're not to be messed with. Thank you, Stuart. Um, this next question is probably an easy one to answer. We can do it by show of hands. Would you ever go back to a permanent role? Hands up for yes. From the panel, that and Stuart. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, no, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't disregard it altogether if it was right. No, I wouldn't. No. Okay. So we're 
I think I think the fact that the hand doesn't go up straight away is a, is a distinct uh, maybe uh, for the right opportunity. Yeah, uh, by the sounds of it. Um, okay, moving on to uh, the next one. Uh, one that says to Phil, how are you finding the interim market at the moment? Um, it's starting to pick up. I do think that um, it will pick up as 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 businesses start to get back to you know to to full swing. I think the furlough just seems to put life on pause uh, pause a little bit for a lot of businesses. Um, obviously, they choose how to use furlough according to their own situation. But I think as furlough finishes and um, and the part times go back and schools go back, then the world will start changing and that's a need for interim um, as they decide that they need to do change management and, and change structures or, or, or hit um, you know, particular issues head on. So yeah, the, the interim, the also the interim market in the last four recessions um, when, and, and, and recruitment has been quieter, it's been the interim market that's bounced back um, more than the permanent market in the recruitment sector. So the busy period, um, is in the in the uh, in the bounce back is for six months is interim, so um, and that's a recruitment statistic. Um, so next one, um, maybe Stuart um, or Sat could answer. You know, let you put your hand up. Have you ever had to pay to gain access to clients uh, or um, or networking groups? Um, no. no. A lot of free networking out there, isn't there? So, uh, fine. Um, that's most of the questions, to be honest. There's one or two, we've not been able to get through them all, but I am conscious of, of time. So, um, just a, a, um, if anyone does want to reach out to you, I know Stuart and Sat, you're both on LinkedIn. Are you happy for, for anyone to reach out directly? Yes, If I anyone's am. got a, yes. a particular question, for Robin, I've got Robin's email address. They can maybe route that uh, through me, but um, certainly Sat and Stuart, um, if uh, people want to connect directly with you on LinkedIn. Um, and for those of you that do get an interim assignment um, and need to make some changes, I'm going to do a shameless plug here. We've got accountancy recruit that can obviously help you uh, kit out your uh, any needs in your team. But no, um, uh, seriously, yeah. You know, thank you everyone for listening. We don't charge for um, for the any webinars we do. All we ask is, if you do uh, enjoy the webinars, um, do put a comment. Um, I'll post a, a link to everyone afterwards. Do put a comment in the uh, comments box to to give us your feedback, and it does help. Um, uh, that we use that through LinkedIn. It does help spread the awareness uh, to you know to other networks um, about our webinars that we're doing. So that's all we ask. Um, but a massive thank you to everyone who's tuned in to listen. A thank you to, to our panelists that have given up their time to uh, you know give us their ad advice there. So um, thank you very much. And on that note, I'd like to formally bring the session to a close. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Phil. Thank you.